Hey there, you fabulous folks. I hope your day has been absolutely awesome. Welcome back to another new episode of What If Deku Was a Conduit. Instead of inheriting one for all from All Might, what if Izuka got another sort of power? Something stronger, and is a lot more versatile. A conduit with the power of smoke? And what if he gained said power when he encountered the Banner Man himself, Delson Rowe? But what is this other power within him? Tingling and sharp, like lightning. A big shout out to the amazing author behind this fanfiction, and show them some love, you'll find their details in the description box below. If this what if scenario is getting your imagination going, drop a comment down below and share your thoughts. And don't forget to explore more mind-blowing what ifs on the channel. Alright, without further ado, let's jump right into this video. Explosions and yells of anger can be heard echoing in an abandoned gym as an ash blonde teen used his quirk to destroy yet another punching bag. With the busted gym equipment and destroyed punching bags scattered around the gym floor, you can clearly tell that the boy was pissed, really pissed. This boy is none other than Katsuki Bakugo, quirk, explosion. He had been coming back in this abandoned gym for two days straight from morning to noon and back after lunch just to release some pent-up frustration he had for the past couple of days. Who wouldn't? Just a week ago he was caught up with a fight with Deku and the nerd had successfully fought back and even broke his nose. What's worse is that the nerd had outed him with a fucking straight face, no stutters, no fidgeting like a scared animal. He snitched on him without hesitation and what makes it more irritating to the blonde is that the principal looked convinced, giving Katsuki three weeks of suspension, while Deku and his cronies two weeks. And making that day even worse is he got attacked by a villain that tries too hard to impersonate a shiny mook and knocking him unconscious. The heroes in the area didn't even move to save him and just looked at his waiting for a hero with a more compatible quirk. Heroes my ass. If it weren't for All Might he would have been dead. And he should be thankful for that, right? No. He looked weak in front of the number one hero, the same person he was going to surpass. And the worst part of it was, the whole thing was broadcasted in all of Japan. Katsuki Bakugo never needed any saving, he was supposed to be the strongest in his generation and is more than qualified as a candidate for UA. Call it prideful, but prideful is his middle name. But what angers him the most is when he woke up in the hospital. He woke up to see his parents looking at him with different expressions than they usually give him. His dad was looking at him with disappointment, while his mom was looking at him with worry and sadness. When he tried to ask them why they are looking at him like that, his dad just scoffed at him and left the room while his mom just teared up and followed his dad. Confusion getting in his head. When he was released, his parents barely talked to him and only when he heard them talking to each other it all made clear. It was Deka's fault. It was always his fault. The damn nerd had not only grew a spine to fight back, but also told his mom how Katsuki bullied and hit the green it. That damn quirkless loser even told his mom that Katsuki deserved getting attacked by the villain. Auntie Inko then relayed this information to his parents, and here he is now. Katsuki was forbidden to use his phone, PC and gaming consoles for the remainder of the suspension period and his allowance was cut off by 40%. It pissed him off. Really, really pissed. The thought made him even angrier, and he began obliterating another punching bag which he imagined Deku's face on it. Damn you DKU! You useless piece of shit! I'll make you pay! He said as explosions echoed in the building once more. This happened while he was thinking of ways to torture the bastard, being suspended be damned. In Dagoba Beach. We see two clouds of smoke moving in a fast pace around the trash-filled shore as occasional balls of smoke and explosion can be heard and seen to appear to be chasing each other. These clouds of smoke are mentor and student, Delson Rowe and Izuka Midoriya, respectively. It had been a week and five days since they've started training and Izuku is showing so much improvement in such a short period of time. Delson even said to himself that Izuku would surpass him easily just with his smoke and easily overpower him if the boy was able to use his electric side. Though the older conduit told Izuku to try absorb electricity to get a grip of it, the greenette refused and just told him that he want to master smoke first before using his electricity. Izuka even pointed out that he want to use his smoke to pass the exam in honor to Delson. That and he wouldn't want to risk causing a massive blackout in all of Japan. It took the mentor and student 25 before Izuka used a smoke enhanced uppercut on Delson's chin. This made the older conduit staggered backwards before getting tackled, or should I say speared him to the sand. Delson was about to use a smoke shot to Izuka's face before a hand made its way on his face. 
yield, Izuka said in a serious tone, unusual to be heard on the carefree boy. Delson had to submit before Izuka jump off him while giving the older man a smug grin. Welp, that's 5047. My lead. Better luck next time, old man. He said making Delson gain a tick mark on his head. It had only been a week and a couple of days and Izuka transformed from a timid, meek nerd into a smug, cocky bastard like Delson himself. Okay one, I'm not that old. And two, you got lucky, brat. He snapped back in annoyance as he stood up before dusting off the sand on his jeans. He looked at the boy, who just laughed and walked towards a motorcycle that they hit in their game of smoke tag, and absorbed the smoke from it. Also, don't get too full of yourself, Izuku. You still have a long way to go. Though he said that, he knew damn well that that wasn't luck. He was outclassed by a younger conduit, and Izuku had just been a conduit for a week and five days. The kid's a prodigy. He learns and takes everything Dels and shows him like a sponge. He couldn't help but wonder how strong the boy would get when he began training in Yue. Putting that aside, you need stay humble kid. I know you are enjoying your powers right now but being cocky won't bring anything good kid. Izuka looked at the man with a curious expression. Trust me. I know. That made Izuka nod a bit before looking at his hands as smoke covered it. It took Izuka 10 seconds of staring at his hand before looking back at the older man with a smile on his face. Don't worry, Delaware. I'll keep that in mind. Delson grinned before ruffling his green hair in an affectionate way. Good. Now run along. You wouldn't want your mom to worry. Delson said which made Izuka's face fall into a sad look. This didn't go unnoticed to the older conduit. Something wrong? Izuka hesitated for a bit and took a deep breath. Not much. Just had an argument with my mom, he said blandly as he sat down the sand, eyes glued to the crashing waves. The banner man looked at the boy with a curious expression. Care to share? He asked as he sat next to the boy. The younger conduit was silent for a bit. It took him five minutes before he told his mentor his argument with his mom. Izuka told his mentor how he had told his mom how Bakugu had treated him after all these years and how he punched the crap out of the blonde's nose how he reacted when she told him that Katsuki got attacked by a villain, and how he yelled at his mom when he told her that he wasn't friends with the bully. Delson didn't say anything and just listened intently at the boy. He noticed the slight anger when Bakuda's name was mentioned and the hint of joy when he described how he punched the bully. Throughout Izuka's ranting, Delson saw how sad he looked when he mentioned his mom. After Izuka finished talking, he looked at his mentor for a reaction. Delson just looked at the ocean for a solid 10 seconds before talking. Damn, that's a lot to take in. He said as looked at the boy and smiled. Let me start with how you reacted to your bully. Thinking why you had reacted to his attack was nothing but a way to release your frustrations. He said and chuckled a bit. There is nothing better than a bully getting put to his place. And by standing up for yourself will either make him stop messing with you or make him want to screw you up. And hearing how he reacted to your punch he will be the latter. But I don't think he'll be stupid enough to do the same thing knowing the consequences. He said reassuring the Greenette that Bakuga will not attack him. Oh how wrong he was. Though if he does attack you. Well blackmail can always be an option. He said as he chuckled darkly making Izuka's sweat drop at the sudden 180 degree change in personality. Delson then stopped chuckling and looked at Izuka with a serious expression. When it comes to your mom. I want to slap you in the head for shouting at her. Never ever shout at your mother he said sternly. This made Izuka lower his head in shame. He had really regretted yelling at his mom and hearing his mentor scold him about it hurts him. But hearing everything that you have been through, I'll say that what you did was understandable, wrong but understandable the less. He looked at the boy. Seeing that Izuka is still looking down with a shamed expression, made his expression soften. He places his hand on the boy's curly locks. Don't think about it too much. I'm sure your mom would forgive you. Just give her time. Trust me. I know, I also had arguments with Betty and yet we forgive each other and grew closer. He said with a smile and a sense of longing, remembering his late friend slash mother figure back in the Akamish tribe. Izuka hesitantly looked at the older man. He was still sad but seeing Delson's smile made him crack a small smile. Have you told her that you're a conduit? Delson asked as he met the boy's stare. Izuka simply shook his head and looked down. No, I haven't. I couldn't. I'm afraid that she would become even more distant. His mentor nodded and looked back to the sea. I understand. It is hard being a conduit in a world full of quirks. They'll judge and fear us just by being a conduit. It's almost as worse as being quirkless. 
maybe even worse, Delson said as he grimaced remembering how he was treated the time he came to Japan. The heroes almost got him arrested. Almost, since they could stand up after fighting them. But she deserves to know, Izuku. It doesn't matter if you two are still in a fight. She's your mom. Whatever her reaction is, it doesn't matter. He looked back at the boy and grabbed his shoulder, earning a look from the boy. Izuku just nodded in understanding, and looked back at the ocean, Delson mirroring his action. They stayed like that before Izuku stood up. You're right, Delaware. She deserves to know. I'll tell her when I get home. He said as he looked at the man who just gave him a smile before smirking. When was I wrong? He challenged the boy. Only to be surprised when Izuku suddenly pulled out a notepad from thin air. And nerdy spectacles suddenly appear on his eyes. Well let's see, the time you thought that you said that James Heller is stronger than Alex Mercer, the time you said Joaquin Phoenix portrayed Joker the best to know, the time you thought fetch like you more than me. Izuku said with a smirk with the last comment. He met the so-called laser girl two days ago, and to say that she found him cute was an understatement. He had remembered seeing Delson's face when Fetch began rubbing her cheeks on Izuku's freckled cheek was hilarious. He saw the man looking jealous and shocked. Who wouldn't when a lady with a destructive tendency began hugging a 14-year-old boy just because he looked cute? Izuku blushed remembering the affectionate action of the female conduit. She was so nice to him to even offered her powers, Neon to him. Though he was tempted on getting another power, he kindly rejected her offer but told the Pinkette that he will think about it. He shook himself from his thoughts and looked at the man had to stop and urge to laugh out loud when he saw Delson's eyes twitch in irritation, remembering the time he introduced Izuku with Fetch. Whatever smartass. Get lost and go home already! He cried in annoyance earning a laugh from Izuku who just waved him off. They both said their goodbyes and Izuku went home while he stayed back. Come out already, Yagi! I know you're out there, he said to no one in particular. That is when a skinny man with blonde hair showed up from behind a stack of trash. It was All Might in his skinny form. It's been a while, Ro. All Might said earning a deadpan look from the conduit. Cut the chase already, Yagi. What do you want? Delson said in a serious tone. All Might or Tashinori Yagi frowned at this and just sighed. I was just wondering why you were with that boy. Oh, you mean Izuku? I'm training him for the entrance exam for two weeks. He paused and stood up. He was about to continue when All Might interrupted him. Why would you of all people train a middle school student to become a hero when you are not even one? All Might said, emphasizing the you and hero to prove his point. Delson just shrugged and looked at the ocean. Because unlike you, I can see the potential of a person and not judge them nor tell them if they can be a hero just by their quirk or the lack of it. Which reminds me, he then looked at the man with a glare making the hero flinch. You're a fucking hypocrite, he said in an angry tone. You tell the boy that he can't be a hero if he doesn't have a quirk, when you don't even have one in the first place. He glared at Yagi harder making said man look away in shame. And because of that you just lost the best candidate for one for all. That made All Might look at the man in a confused yet shocked look. He was shocked that he knew his quirk that was given to him by his master. What do you mean? He asked cautiously at the banner man. He didn't get why he just lost the best candidate when he knew that Mirio Togata was the best candidate for one for all. Well at least that's what Night Eye said. Delson looked at him and raised his hand with his index finger raised up. One is that he learns quickly and has a giant brain under that patch of curly hair. He then raised his middle finger to make a peace sign. Two, his quirkless and if I'm not mistaken, the perfect successor is an empty vessel to prevent it from overflowing. OFA is a stockpiling quirk that got through seven different user minus your dumbass of course. And giving it to a person with a quirk is basically murdering the successor. All Might heard this and widened his eyes. Not by surprise, but by fear. How does he know all of this? Seemingly reading his mind, Delson answered. Gran Torino told me. That made the blonde hero flinched and frown at the name. Why would his former teacher slash mentor tell Ro that confidential information? He then raised his ring finger making a three. Third and lastly, he smirked and continued. No conduit can have a quirk, he said dropping the news to the blonde buffoon. All Might being shocked was an understatement. The kid he saved from the sludge villain a week ago was a conduit? Why didn't he use his powers to escape the villain? Well, as much as I still want to talk to you, which I don't by the way, he said turning his face away from the man as he turned to the stairs. I need to go now. I still have to do something important. When he said important, 
he meant go get a large burger with fries. So, toodle the motherfucker, he said as he used Smoke Dash to leave the still shell-shocked hero to his own devices. Did he really lose a perfect successor? He looked at the sky and wondered. Nana, what do you think? Two days later, in an orange skied afternoon, we see Azuka sitting down on the beach side, watching the ocean as the sounds of waves and birds can be heard in the background. Today was the last day that he will be training with Delsin but the man didn't came. Izuka had wondered why the man didn't came but it struck him. He was going to leave tomorrow morning and had to pack for his flight back to America. Izuka understood this and just stayed in the beach for the rest of the day. He didn't really mind since by tomorrow he would go back to school. His suspension was over anyway. After today, his life will be back to how it had always been. The only difference is, he is more confident and has a bigger chance to pass the entrance exam. He was completely lost in thought when a voice called from behind him. Hey, Izuku! The voice said which made Izuku snap out of it and quickly looked behind him. There he saw Delson walking towards him, a bag on his left shoulder. Izuku stood up and smiled at the man. Delson smiled back and when he was a couple of meters away from Izuku, he took of the back and threw it to Izuku. The bag landed on Izuku's arms, albeit barely. Izuku looked at it for a while before looking back at the man with a confused look. Delson just laughed and placed his hands on the pockets of his vest. Look inside, he said gesturing at the bag. Izuku just looked at him with a raised eyebrow. He then looked at the bag and slowly opened it. When he does, his eyes widen and looked at the man in front of him with a shock expression. Delson just nodded and Izuku took out what is in the bag. He pulled out the object that was supposed to be in the bag. Now in his hands, Izuka held out a dark forest green zip-up hoodie, a black denim vest with red and blue pattern in each front side and what appears to be a silver-colored mouth guard. Izuku inspected the items and looked at the man in front of him. Are these? He asked the man without looking up. Delson just grinned at the boy and said, Yeah, that's my gift for you. It's kinda big but you'll still grow, and you won't be using that until you entered UA anyway. You like it? Izuku just looked up and gave him a big smile. Are you kidding? This is the best gift I got in my whole life. His eyes then landed on the mouth guard. But what's with the mouth guard? He asked as he looked at the man once more. He saw him smirk and instantly grew a headache. That's a noise-canceling mouth guard. Blocks every sound that you and your muttering, sputtering mouth releases. Delson laughed while Izuku just gave him a deadpan look that says, Are you serious? I don't mutter anymore. Izuka grumbled as he looked at the mouth guard, as a smile began to crawl on his face. Thank you, he said looking up. Thank you for everything, Delaware. He bowed to the still laughing man. He was really grateful that he met the man and trained under him even in just a short time. Delson looked at the boy after he stopped laughing, slightly taken aback on the boy's show of gratitude. Sure, Izuka would thank him for the daily training or the compliments that he often gave the boy. Seeing the boy thank him through such a respectful way makes him very happy. After waving off the thank yous that the boy had gave him and waited for the boy to straight up before looking at the boy with a small grin. Stand up, Izuku. You're embarrassing me. He said sheepishly waving his hands as a blush was dusting his face. They both laughed at this. They began to talk to each other about what had they been doing the whole day. Well, Delson was since Izuku was only waiting for the man in the beach. Delson told him that he was busy on the paperwork that is needed for his departure tomorrow morning. They talked for what seems to be an hour when they noticed that the sun was almost setting. At that moment, they decided to go home. As they were about to part ways, Delson had stopped Izuku. Confusion seemingly visible in the greenette's face. The older didn't say a word but just looked at the boy before raising his right arm and removing his chain. He held it on his hand first before looking at the boy and smiling. The day I met you, I knew to myself that you will surpass me, not only in using smoke but as a conduit. In my whole life, I never someone who had suffered so much yet can still show a genuine smile and care for those around them. He paused as he held the chains with stronger grip. He looked at Izuku who was just staring at him. I made a lot of mistakes in my time as a vigilante or freedom fighter and had made too many. I want you to promise me that whatever happens, be careful in the decisions that you will make in the future. Because trust me, a boomerang returns back to the person that throws it. He said earning a nod from the boy. Delson smiled at this and took Izuka's hand and handed him the chain. I used this chain to save and help those who are in need and almost killed a couple of lives with it. He paused before looking Izuka in the eye. 
Promise me that you will use this chain to help, heal and not destroy. He said as he looked Izuku dead in the eye. He was taken aback at the same intensity that Izuku sent to him. Delson smirked inwardly at the boy's stare. I promise to save and help those who are in need. You have my word, Banner Man. Izuka said as he clutched the chain in his hand before wrapping it on his right wrist. For some reason, it felt, he looked at it and smiled. They began walking until they stopped in an intersection. They said their goodbyes and Izuka looked at the man who began walking to the opposite side of the intersection. So this is where we part ways. He kept on looking at the man's retreating form as he felt a pit in his stomach. Not even noticing it, he was tearing up. He had grew fond of the older conduit and thought of him as the older brother and friend that he never had. Izuka looked at the chain that Delson had gave him and clenched his fist. Delson! He yelled at the man. Seeing the man turn toward him, Izuka used smoke dash to get closer to the older conduit and did the most logical thing he had thought at the moment. He hugged the man. Shocked at the display that the boy is showing him, he melted in the hug and began patting the boy's back. Delson wouldn't say it out loud, but he knew that he loved the kid like a little brother that he never had. I'm gonna miss this kid. It took them a couple of minutes before they broke up the hug. Izuku was wiping a tear from his eyes and smiled at the man. You're gonna come back to Japan, right? He asked the man who gave him a ruffle on the hair and grinned at the boy. Of course. He said before he looked at the boy and reached out for his fist for a fist bump. Pass the entrance exam and be the hero you always wanted to be. I'll be rooting for you. Izuka smiled at the man before fist bumping with the older conduit. I will I promise. With one last hug, they turned away from each other and the duo went on their separate ways. Unknown to Izuku, Delson looked back at him and gave him one last smile. Good luck Izuku. He whispered before smoke dashing away. Izuka had just arrived home. He has a large grin in his face and he kept fidgeting with the chain on his wrist. He even looked at the bag where his new and future hero costume is placed. Saying he was happy is an understatement. He had never felt to bless all his life. And it's all thanks to Delson Rowe. He would do his best to pass the entrance exam in nine months in order to not only be a hero but be the first conduit to become a hero. As he entered the house, he heard that there was a noise coming from the kitchen. Hearing something sizzling and stirring, he immediately thought that his mom was cooking. Izuka remembered the talk he had with Delson and even after that he didn't talk to his mom the time he got home like he promised. He thought that he still need to gather some courage to talk to his mom. But remembering the look of sadness he had caused his mom, he couldn't help but feel angry at himself. He needs to talk to her. He needs to apologize to her. And he needs to tell her that he's a conduit. Breathing in and out, Izuka made up his mind. He walked to the kitchen and saw his mom was cooking something on the stove. He noticed that she was saying, or should I say muttering something. He sweat dropped at his mom's muttering spree. It's genetic I guess. He walked slowly toward her and hugged her from behind. He had to suppress a laugh when she violently flinched and eeped in surprise. She looked up and saw Izuka looking at her with a small smile. She went back to cooking. He frowned a little but didn't show it. I'm sorry for yelling at you, mom. He said in a whisper, hugging his mother tighter. I know I was upset that day, but it wasn't right for me to vent my anger and frustration at you. His mom didn't respond and just continued stirring. Izuka took this as a sign to continue. I'm sorry for being secretive to you but I only did all that because I know that you have so many problems in your mind. And I don't want you to worry about me. You've done so much for that I can't even thank you well enough. I'm lucky to have you as a mom. He felt tears began to form in his green eyes but refused to let it fall. I want to make it up to you, spend more time with you and be a better son. I want to tell you everything I've been up to for the past two weeks and I want to tell you something. He said, seeing no visible reaction he looked down. I see. He thought sadly. He was on the verge of crying and only his willpower was keeping his tears from falling. But I know that you're still not ready to talk to me. I'll go rest on my room now. Thank you for listening. Good night. He planted a kiss on her head. I love you. He whispered and released her from his hug. He took a step back and turned away. The moment he closed the door of his room and lied on his bed, he broke down in tears. He felt so ashamed and sad at the same time. He's always got the cold shoulder from his peers and teachers but it coming from his mom felt so painful. Delson's words came back to him. A boomerang returns back to the person that throws it. He understood it clearly and is feeling the karma of his emotional outburst last time they talked. Izuka didn't mind it. 
He deserves this pain, this feeling of loneliness, this feeling of emptiness, and he knew it. He sobbed himself to sleep with one thought in his mind. At least I tried. In the other side of the house, we can hear muffled sobs coming from the kitchen as Inko Midoriya cried as she felt the pain in the voice of her son's voice. She wanted to respond to what Izuku had said, as he wanted to apologize to him for being distant and being a bad mother. But after Izuku told her that he kept his pain to himself because he doesn't want to worry, she couldn't help but felt sad and can't find the right words to say. Inko felt the pain when Izuku kissed her on the top of the head and almost cried when he said, I love you, to her. The moment he closed the door of his room, Inko collapsed and covered her mouth to silence out the sobs that tried to escape her throat. I'm sorry, Izuku. I'm so sorry. And that is the reason why laws against public quirk use is made. That's all for today. Class dismissed. With that said, the teacher left the classroom as the students began putting away their notebooks, books and writing utensils into their bags. Some even exited the room to go home or hang out. Izuku just finished writing what was in the board, immediately stood up and began putting away his stuff. And as he was doing that, a scent of burnt banana entered his nostrils and he groaned inwardly. He looked to his front and saw a certain blonde. It had been five months since their fight and Bakugo's suspension ended. When the blonde came back, he tried to get back at Izuku for breaking his nose and for snitching about Katsuki's sour behavior. Even blamed Izuku for his allowance getting cut and consoles confiscated. Katsuki would have blasted Izuki using his quirk if he hadn't been stopped by their homeroom teacher and was warned to withdraw his UA application and be blacklisted from any hero school. This caused shock and anger from Izuku and Katsuki, respectively. Izuku was shocked that not only his teacher told Katsuki to stop but also made the blonde think of his chances at UA before laying a finger on Izuku. He looked at the teacher and was surprised to see a genuine smile given to him and a look of care that he had been looking for all these years. It made his tear up a bit and smiled back. Katsuki was angry. No, that's an understatement. He was livid. Who wouldn't? Just three weeks before his suspension, every single teacher in their goddamn school wouldn't bat an eye on the useless piece of shit, Deku. But now, just because he got a hit on him, they act like Deku is some kind of god or something? It enraged the blonde and his lackeys didn't even do anything to make Deku's life hell while he was in suspension. Like why the hell didn't they put Deku on his place? Fucking useless. Izuku just shrugged as he collected his stuff and completely ignored the blonde. But Katsuki has a different thing in mind. He began to walk towards Izuku, with his lackey lagging not far behind him but far enough to not end up in the crossfire once again. They knew how Katsuki's explosion felt and they wouldn't want to get hit by it ever again. And they wouldn't want to get punched in the face by Izuku like how he punched Katsuki last time. Where do you think you're going, Deku? He asked in his usual menacing tone that used to scare Izuku. The greenette just ignored him and kept putting away his stuff into his bag, as if he didn't heard the blonde talk. This annoyed the blonde and growled. Are you ignoring me? Duh. Izuka thought, without stopping what he was doing. His lack of response further infuriated the blonde and gritted his teeth. As Izuka was about to take the last notebook, Katsuki slammed his hand on top of the table making Izuka pause. Everyone who were still in the classroom jumped at the loud sound. He would have flinched like the others if it was still five months ago. But experiencing that for ten freaking years made him immune of Katsuki's special greetings. Bakugo saw this and wasn't happy about the reaction. He had expected Deku to flinch like the coward he is but instead just paused and didn't even look phased by his loud slam. As he was about to snap at the quirk genius, Izuka's head rose. The greenette looked at the blonde with a blank expression, an expression that made the explosive blonde angrier. What do you want, Katsuki? He said in a bored tone. I asked you a question, Deku? Bakugo growled out. And stop calling me Katsuki. Oh, if I was ignoring you. Yeah, obviously. Izuka said nonchalantly and snatched the notebook on the table and putting it inside his bag. And to where I was going, where do you think? You, eh? In five months, yeah, but now home. Are you talking back to me? Bakugo yelled out in annoyance, not liking how Izuku is talking back to him. Izuku, however, raised an eyebrow. That's how a conversation works, he said blankly, making the blonde growl even more and some of the people in the room stifle a giggle, even Katsuki's lackeys were suppressing a laugh. After closing the bag, he slung it on his shoulders and began walking to the door. It took him two steps before his shoulder was gripped by an explosion in Hans' grip. 
You think you're funny, Deku? He just stopped walking and looked at his shoulder, before looking at the blonde with narrowed eyes. Let go of me, Katsuki, he said in a low voice. Though he was unnerved by the greenette's tone, he continued. Or what, Deku? He said in a challenging tone, smirk showing. I will make the broken nose I gave you look like a pimple. The greenette said still in the same tone, but with narrowed eyes. It didn't hurt since he was a conduit, but his uniform just got ironed this morning and this sweaty ass mother trucker is ruining it. Everyone in the room felt a shiver in their spines when they heard Izuku's tone of voice. Some of the girls there can be seen to have a tint of pink on their cheeks, hearing how hot Izuku sounded. Katsuki didn't budge and was about to mock Izuku, when all of a sudden he slammed on the classroom floor. Izuku just performed a perfect judo throw on the blonde. A sickening thud can be heard as Katsuki groaned in pain. The onlookers were shocked at this, even the lackeys were stunned and winced on how Izuku, the corkless kid, just threw Katsuki, the best student, to the ground with ease and mastery. They stared at the grunting Bakugo before laying their eyes on Izuku, who was fixing his charred uniform as if he hadn't did the throw. Izuku began walking towards the door, passing by Katsuki's lackeys who were looking at him with awe and fear. He walked towards the door and the crowd began to make a path for him, as if he was royalty or something. Before walking out of the door, he paused and looked back at Katsuki, who was beginning to stand up painfully. The greenette smirked at the grunting blonde and looked around. He saw some of his classmates looking at him with fear. Ah, and wait is that a blush? He blinked when he saw some of his female classmates have blushes covering their faces and slowly turned then walk away. Oh boy. Don't tell me. I'm starting to get fangirls, he said as he sprinted out of the room not hearing the sudden yell and explosion that echoed in the classroom. Dagoba Municipal Beach Park It's been a while since the last time I've been here, said a nostalgic Tashinori Yagi K. All Might is walking towards the stairs of the Dagoba Municipal Beach Park in a brisk pace. He was looking longingly at the ocean, completely ignoring the junk that is blocking the beach's stunning smooth, white sand. Though looking like a junkyard, Tashinori can't stop but smile at the sight of the once breathtaking ocean as he remembered his days when he was still training with his master. This was the same place where he got his quirk from her, and this place will be the same place where he will pass it down. Yes. He came here to meet up with his former sidekick, Sir Naitai and pass on one for all to his protege, Mirio Togata also known as Lamillion. A young man with the same physic as and goal as Tashinori. To save people. Though the young teen's goal was to save one million people, it's the same thing. As he walked down the stairs of the beach park and saw his former sidekick talking to a young man with a very muscular build and blonde hair arranged in a cowlick. Observing the young man, he immediately guessed that this is Mirio Togata. Looking at the younger blonde, he smiled inwardly. Mirai was right. He does look like a perfect candidate for one FO dash. And because of that you just lost the best candidate for one for all. All Might paused on his thoughts when he remembered what his former opponent said to him months ago. It plagued his mind and made him overthink his decision making in his next successor. He may not like Delson Rowe, mainly because the guy humiliated him and endeavor in front of the top 5 heroes at that time, but he can't argue that the man has a point. The moment he saw Midoriya, he saw a shadow of his old self in the young boy, determination, purity and a crave of heroism. He rejected the idea of being a quirkless on the reason of the line of heroics is too dangerous for those who had no power. The boy would be lucky if he passed the entrance exam, though he highly doubted. However, seeing that the boy was a conduit, it would be possible for him to enter the hero course. Though because of the fate of conduits, he would be lucky if he lasted in class for a week. I wanna be a hero! Pokemon advanced! Izuka sang to himself as he walked towards the direction of the Dagoba beach to train. After leaving the campus, Izuku changed into his usual training attire. A fat gum hoodie that he bought after selling all his All Might merch over a plain white t-shirt and gym shorts with his usual red shoes. He planned to go straight to Dagoba Beach. It had been three months since he visited that place to train. He hadn't been there since a month and two weeks after his suspension. He was too focused on his studies. He would always go to the Junkyard Air Beach to train his conduit powers, practicing his abilities, his use of the chain that Delson gave him an experiment on making new moves and combinations incorporated with his chain. Because of the training, he had mastered most of the abilities that Delson chose. His smoke thrusters, smoke dash and other mobility moves are perfect, he can perform all of it with ease and without slowing down. 
His smoke shot and cinder blast are decent but well practiced, so is his sulfur bomb. His cinder missile and orbital drop may need a little bit of practice but since both moves are widespread attacks and can attract too much attention, so attempting to practice it was a no-go. Though his cinder missile are more practiced than the orbital drop, he has yet to discover how to use or activate his electrokinetic powers. Since he can't find any source of electricity that he can use without risking a massive power shortage in the whole of Japan. A generator or a transformer would be helpful, but those things are too expensive and dangerous, respectively. He'll just train his electrokinesis in UA when he pass the entrance exams. And pass he will. As he turn a corner, Izuku had to stop on his tracks when he heard a loud crash in an alleyway. The alleyway was the same alleyway where Akira dragged him and met and got saved by Delson. He shivered when he remembered how defenseless he had been that day. Shrugging the memory of, he looked at the dark alleyway with narrowed eyes. Trying to look in the dark, narrow alley. Izuku then had his eyes widen when he saw three shadows in the alleyway. And by the looks of it, someone was in trouble. Not really thinking straight, he slowly walked in the alleyway as quietly as he can to not grab attention. As he approached the figures, he saw two thugs and a girl with raven hair. Looking closely at the girl, Izuku can see that she is shaking in fear and has scratches on her face. He had to look away when he saw the front of her school uniform slightly was ripped open, revealing an average bust being held by a black sports bra. The girl was backing away from the thugs while whimpering. Izuku then looked back at the thugs and saw that they were grinning and cackling like madmen. He recognized the thugs from the news on TV. Those two were the wanted criminals, guilty of theft, vandalism and some cases of rape. He knew that look of madness and lust coming from the thugs and it angered him. They were planning on molesting the girl. Enraged, Izuku unconsciously activated his smoke and began sprinting towards the thugs. Not noticing the cloud of smoke racing towards them, one of the thugs stepped forward the whimpering ravenet. He was about to take another step when a smoking fist landed on his face and sent him flying towards a trash bin with a loud crash, knocking the man unconscious. The other thug was in a mix of shock and surprised when his partner was sent flying. He quickly looked to Izuku's direction and growled. You son of a bitch! You'll pay for that! His fingernails began growing in length, and he lunged forward to Izuku. The thug had his claws in a slashing form. Only goal is to cut the boy in two. Watch out! The girl screamed at Izuku's direction as the man came only a feet away from him, only to see Izuku getting covered in smoke and the claw pass through him. The girl and the thug blinked in confusion when Izuku disappeared from the man's view and appeared behind him. Izuku then did a move that he saw in Delson's memory. He covered his hands with smoke and grabbed the man on the head and slammed him to the ground. When the man was on the ground, he pushed smoke into the man's face, knocking the man unconscious. After that, Izuku grabbed the man by his leg and dragged him towards his buddy. When he placed them back to back, he then took out a roll of flex tape he had in his bag and tied the two criminals. Why he had flex tape in his bag? We'll never know. Grunting in satisfaction of his work, Izuku stood up and turned to the girl, who was looking at him with awe and shock. He then walked towards her and stopped in front of the ravenette. The young conduit then unzipped his jacket making the girl flinch a bit. She then flinched once again when the jacket was placed on top of her. Wouldn't want you to get cold, right? He asked. Looking up, she saw Izuku reached a hand towards her. The girl looked at his hand and back at him, before grabbing hold of his outstretched hand. Izuku then held it tight as he pulled her up. The girl almost fell if it weren't for Izuku's hand. Are you okay? He asked the girl. She just looked at him and nodded timidly. Thank you. She said in a soft voice. A small blush covered her cheeks when she saw his freckles. Happy to help, he said with a smile. Izuku then looked at the girl and analyzed her face. Now that he looked closely at the girl, he noticed that she has red pupils and a small scar on her right eyelid. He had to stop a blush from forming on his cheeks when he looked at down her lips and saw that she had sharp teeth. Shaking off his thoughts, Izuku let go of her hand and looked at the still unconscious thugs then back to the girl. Can you call the police to take them? He asked her in a soft tone. Receiving a nod, he sighed in relief. He then took his bag off the ground and slung it on his sleeves, standing up and looking at the girl who was still looking at him. I'll be leaving now, take care, he said as he began walking away. Hey wait, the girls called out from behind. Izuku stopped and looked back at her. Yes? He asked, tilting his head. Izuku saw her blush a bit making him raise an eyebrow. 
Is she sick or something? What's your name? She asked in a timid voice, looking down a bit. Izuka thought about it for a sec then shrugged. No harm in telling her my name, right? Izuku. My name's Izuka Midoriya. How about you? Eiji. Eiji Kurishima. She said while clutching the fat gum hoodie Izuka lent her. Th thank you for saving me. She said bowing repeatedly at the boy. Izuka couldn't help but chuckle at the girl's actions. He found it weird, in a good way, that a girl is bowing to him. You're welcome, Kiri-chan. Just be careful, okay? He said earning a nod from the girl. He nodded to her. Before walking away, Izuka continued. Wouldn't want a beautiful girl like you to get hurt. He said, winked before dashing away in a cloud of smoke, leaving a blushing Eiji. Eiji stared at the spot where Izuka was and smiled. Izuka Midoriya. What a manly name. She though as she clutched the hoodie covering her damaged uniform. I hope I see you again. She then fished out her phone from her bag and quickly called the police. After the police had taken the criminals and asking for the details about what happened, not mentioning Izuku, she began walking home. On her way home, she entered a convenience store and bought hair dye. She was supposed to come here earlier before those thugs dragged her in the alleyway. They asked for her belongings and threatened her that they will do something to her. Then ripping off her uniform to make a point. Because of fear and shock, she collapsed and froze up. If it weren't for Izuku, she wouldn't know what would have happened to her. Izuku, Izuku Midoriya. Ah yes her savior. Her hero. Her knight in shining armor. Eiji felt safe when she saw and held on his hand. The way he easily manhandled the thugs was so manly. The way he placed the hoodie on her was so manly. The way he looked at her was so manly. The way he complimented her was so manly. The way Izuku Midoriya radiated heroic vibes as he moved to save her was so manly. Blushing hard, she shocked off her thoughts and went to the cosmetics section. Taking the red dye to pay for it, she began to wonder. Would he like it, if I dyed my hair red? It took Izuku 20 minutes to get back to their apartment complex. He was supposed to go to Dagoba Beach, when he decided not to. His encounter with the thugs while saving a girl were enough of a training for him for now. He felt good saving someone who needs help, but had to leave immediately before any police or hero arrived at the location. He wouldn't risk his chances in entering UA by getting caught doing vigilante work, especially since he is a conduit. As he smoke dashed his way home, he saw a truck not far from him driving past him with an uncontrollable speed, and a couple of meter in front of the truck was a woman passing the streets. Judging by the speed of the truck, it won't be long before it hit the woman. And since the woman was carrying grocery bags, knowing that the truck was going to hit the woman, Izuka began to smoke dash towards the woman. With a burst of speed he was trying to outrun the truck. But it probed as a terribly hard task as the vehicle was too fast. This didn't stop Izuka as he pushed his limits and dashed faster. In a moment he was lagging behind the truck. Next he was meters away from the vehicle and was now close to the woman. Without warning, Izuka scooped the woman in a bridal's carry and smoke dashed to the other side of the pedestrian lane. To his luck and relief, they were only seconds before the truck sped past them with a loud honk but not even stopping. Izuka was panting when he stopped. That was quite an effort for him. Good thing, he began training his legs in running. And good thing he was fast enough to get to the woman. Speaking of the woman. Ma'am are you okay Dash? Izuku didn't get to continue as he blanched at when he recognized who the woman he had just saved. Sweating and shaking, Izuka looked at the woman still in his arms. Oh no. Mom? In the quiet apartment of the Midoriya residence, a small click can be heard indicating that the door had just closed. Also means that Izuku just left the house for school. In the kitchen of the small apartment Inko Midoriya is aimlessly washing her dishes. A sad expression was visible on the short woman's face. She turned her head at the covered food on the dining table and frowned. Izuku had skipped breakfast again. She let out a small sigh as she went back into drying the wash dishes. It had been three days ever since Inko was saved by her son as she was about to get hit by a speeding truck. At that day, she saw her corkless son use some kind of smoke-related powers to keep her from getting hit by the truck. She was shocked and surprised. Somehow, Izuku had unlocked his quirk and had used it to save her from meeting her end. After almost 10 years of being diagnosed as quirkless, he unlocked his quirk. She automatically thought that he would be happy to tell her this, but no. That day when he saw her face and realized who he had saved, only one thing was seen in his eyes. It wasn't shock nor surprise. 
It was what she least expected to see in her son's eyes. Fear. Inko saw how scared Izuku was when he saw her face. The visible paling of his face. The trembling of his body. The fast and heavy breaths he produced as if having a panic attack. The way Izuku deliberately ran away after setting her down on the sidewalk. It confused her. She expected Izuku to stutter and mutter a two-page long explanation of getting caught using his quirk and the quirk itself. But no, he just ran and ran without looking back. Ever since that day, Izuku made his best effort to avoid Inko. And if ever they encounter each other, he would find a reason to get away from her. The thing that confused Inko is why. Why would Izuku be so scared at being seen using the smoke powers? Was his powers considered villainous? And most importantly, why was he so scared that his own mom saw it? Finishing up, Inko went to the living room for rest. It was her day off from one of her jobs and she was supposed to use this day off to clear out her mind from the stress that had happened for the past three days. Inko began recalling everything that had happened in the past five months. The time Izuku came home late, he informed her that his friend Katsuki was bullying him for ten years and he had enough and fought back, breaking said boy's nose. After that, her son got suspended for two weeks and had somehow got attacked by a villain twice at the same day, but somehow survived and scathed. While Katsuki was attacked by one villain and got hospitalized. Then, Izuki yelled at her when she wanted him to go with her visit the blonde bully. Her son tried to apologize to her but she didn't talk to him. After five months during their last conversation, she discovered his son having a quirk but he is scared when she saw it. And that's why we are here. She thought about it all for a while before she began trembling in shame. She had just ignored her son's humble apology and his way of admitting that it was wrong for him to yell at her. And what's worse is that she completely avoided him for five months, like she didn't even acknowledge his words. Inko sighed as she placed her face on her hands to suppress a groan. What a mother I am. She stood up from the couch and made her way to her room for a nap when she suddenly saw Izuka's room was slightly open. She was about to walk away from the slightly open door, but when she noticed something odd. Peering inside, her eyes widened with the design of the room. Well, the lack of it. She slowly opened the room and saw that Izuka's All Might themed room was now a shell of its old self. All of the All Might poster, action figures, carpets etc gone, everything that he collected and paid for the last 10 years, all gone. Now in his room is a plain dark grey wallpaper, covered with art and posters of musicians and other heroes such as Fat Gum, Ed Shot, Best Genus, and other more. So much had changed for the past 5 months and only today that Inko is seeing it all. She frowned as she walked towards the desk near the bed and inspected the contents. There she saw some of his hero journals and picture frames that Inko didn't remember was there the last time she entered the room. Taking the first picture frame, she held it up. Inko's eyes started tearing when she saw the first picture. The picture of a younger Izuku in an All Might onesie being held up by her. Both of them were smiling widely as Izuku's arm was in the air, assuming a hero pose. Inko had to keep a tear from streaming down her cheeks as she hugged the picture closely to her. Emotional as she remembered how happy and excited Izuku had been when they were playing heroes. Help! Inko cried out while being covered by a white blanket. A smile covered her face when she heard small footsteps coming from outside the door. The door slammed open, and there came Izuku in his favorite All Might onesie. Arms raised and smile wide as he yelled out. I am here! He ran forward as he hugged Inko from behind. Inko giggled and faced her son, hugging him back. Thank you, my hero. Their smiles and laughter can be heard echoing in the small room of the apartment as the memory faded. Inko calmed down from crying as she wiped her eyes and nose with a handkerchief she had in her skirt. She let a small smile on her face as she placed the picture frame back down the desk. She looked at it for a second before looking on the other picture frame. The picture consists of two people on the stairs of the Dagoba Municipal Beach Park. The first one was Izuku. Who was holding on the camera. His face was was a little sweaty and looked like he had spent all day working out. It might be the case if the swollen muscles on his arm is an indication. Inko then looked at the second person who was a little bit at the back in the photo. He was a man in his thirties. He was wearing a red flannel shirt under a white hoodie jacket. Over the jacket was a denim jacket and he is wearing jeans and black Converse shoes. Most noticeable from the man's appearance is a chain wrapped his right wrist and a red beanie on top his head. In the picture, the two were grinning widely while gesturing a peace sign. Inko didn't know the man, but as she looked at the man in scrutiny, 
the man began to look familiar as time passed by. She was about to give up on recognizing the man when she saw a note at the back of the picture. Looking at it, she quickly recognized Azuka's hasty yet readable handwriting. Me and Delsin. Her eyes widened when she read the name of the man next to her son in the picture. Delsin Ro, aka as the Banner Man. A conduit that was rumored to use four different conduit powers. The man who had been responsible that Seattle had been saved from a person called Augustine and the Department of Unified Protection, or the DP. And even rumored to have faced all might and had said to have beaten the symbol of peace. She began wondering why the man was with her son. Izuka never had anything similar to the Banner Man. Well, there's one that appears to be the only similarity from Izuku and the man. That would be his smoke quirk. Izuku's smoke quirk. No wait. The smoke. Inko didn't really know if Izuku's smoke powers is a quirk. Her son never confirmed it. His smoke powers similarity with Delson's, and the way he reacted when she saw the powers. Inko widened her eyes when she had put two on two together. Izuku, her son, is a conduit, or others would call them by terrorists. No wonder why he had freaked out when she saw him use the smoke powers. The fear he had in his eyes at that time was fear of being pushed away. Fear of being rejected. Fear of being isolated. It was no secret that conduits, quirk users and quirkless people live in one environment. But after what had happened in New Marais 14 years ago and in Seattle 7 years ago, the world had been skeptical to be around conduits and treat them worse than quirkless people. In terms of acceptability, Corkless people are more accepted than conduits. Though both are isolated and looked down upon, conduits get the shorter end of the stick. She began to tremble as another tear began to form in her eyes. Inko harshly wiped her tears and looked at the first picture with a determined expression. Her son had been suffering from far too long, and she is going to change that. With Izuku. That'll put the ash blonde bastard on the edge. Izuku thought as he did a thief vault over a trash can. He is on his way home and was doing small parkour moves on the small obstacles on the streets and alleyways. He had just made Bakugo back off in the best way possible. Blackmail. Not heroic, but successful. Flashback. Izuku had just placed the last notebook into his bag and was about to leave the classroom. On his way to the door when his path was blocked by Bakugo. Oh boy, here we go. Izuku groaned internally as he looked up at the blonde who had been looking at him with a sinister smirk in his face. What do you think you're going, huh, you shitty nerd? How original. What do you want, Katsuki? Izuka said in a bland tone. He was getting tired of this encounter. Hell, this had been the fifth time this week and it's only Tuesday. The smirk in the blonde's face turned into a scowl for a solid three seconds before going back to a smirk. A smirk which Izuka didn't like one bit. He was about to leave when Katsuki began talking again. So, you're still applying to UA? He asked Izuka in a somewhat amused voice. Izuka had to stop his eyes from narrowing. The way the blonde was talking is really unsettling for his taste. Izuka then looked at the blonde's side and saw that his lackeys were not standing by him. He looked around the classroom and saw them standing near the door with a nervous expression. They were clearly not in what Katsuki was planning. And whatever his plan was, it wasn't good. Well, everything that Bakugo planned against him was never good. Yeah, what about it? Izuka said in a bored tone but was mentally preparing himself. How are you going to pass the exams without a quirk? The question sounded more of an insult than a question. Izuka however just shrugged it off. I'll think of something, he said nonchalantly, like using my conduit powers. Katsuki scoffed before looking at him directly at the eye. If you want to get a quirk, I know a way. This made Izuku raised one of his eyebrows. Not that he was interested, he was just curious where all of this will go. So as if taking the blonde's bait, he responded. Really? What is it? Katsuki only grinned like a maniac before saying the words. If you want a quirk, you can go swan dive off a rooftop and pray you'll get a quirk in your next life. He said with a laugh at the end as he turned away from Izuku. His plan was to make Izuku feel depressed for being powerless. Making the greenette feel useless and worthless so that the shitty nerd would crumble for being quirkless. He was so sure that the nerd would think twice before jiloing to UA and ruin his glory. If you want a quirk you can go swan dive off a rooftop and pray you'll get a quirk in your next life. Bakugo was stopped on his tracks. Wide-eyed as looked back at the green-haired boy. He saw Izuka looking at his phone as a curious expression. Before pressing it. If you want a quirk you can go swan dive off a rooftop and pray you'll get a quirk in your next life. 
Izuka Hum then looked at the blonde who was shocked and lost most of the colors on his face. Suicide baiting? Really, Katsuki? And you wanted to be a hero? Well, if you ain't found out about this, you'd be blacklisted. Izuka said as he saw the paling face of Katsuki turn into rage. Don't you dare, DKU. I'll dash. He was cut off when another recording was played only this time, from behind. He looked at the direction and saw another of his classmates holding his own phone. When he was about to approach the boy who also got a recording of him, another recording played this time from Izuka's back. Another recording played when Katsuki turned to glare at the person, he froze to see one of his lackeys holding his phone up. A serious expression etched on his face. I think this is the time for you grow up, Katsuki. Izuka said making the blonde look back at him. And wake up to reality. Izuka walked past Katsuki, who continued glaring at him. That the world doesn't revolve around you. Watch your actions, Katsuki. Because it's only a matter of time before every single one in this classroom gets tired of your bullshit and use that recording against you. I'll see you tomorrow. Izuka said as he walked past Bakugo's lackey nodding to them and exiting the room. After Izuka left one by one, the other students left as they looked at the still shell-shocked blonde. His lackeys were the last to leave, not looking back at him. As the class emptied and Bakugo was left alone, he snarled and released a loud explosion that was heard throughout the whole campus. End of flashback. That'll teach teach him some humility. He thought as he vaulted over a crate in a random alleyway. Izuka is beginning to love doing parkour. It was a great exercise and experience for him. He'd have to thank Delson for teaching him how to do parkour. After taking a few steps, Izuka was now in front of their apartment building and had to suppress a wince when he remembered the day he saved his mom. He saw how surprised his mom was when she recognized him and was shocked when she noticed Izuka using his smoke powers. Ever since that time, Izuka made it his best effort to avoid his mom. Though it hurt her, he just couldn't see her at the moment. The fear of being rejected and getting shunned by his own mom was plaguing his mind. His logical mind shut down when he saw his mom that time and used the anxiety side of his mind. Emotions got the best of him, and he is paying for it. The struggle to look at his mom is the clear evidence. He sighed as he entered the elevator and pressed the floor of their apartment floor. Stopping on the right floor, Izuka exited the elevator and made his way towards their apartment. As he was in front of the door, he grabbed the doorknob and pushed the door open. The moment he opened the door, he was suddenly pulled by an invisible force. Said force, forcefully pulled Izuka into the apartment. In confusion and slight fear, Izuka looked up and saw his mom with her hands held up. Izuka tried his best to struggle against the hold only to be squeezed tightly, making him release a groan of displeasure. Izuku, we need to talk, Inko said in a shaky voice, seemingly struggling to keep her son in place. Hearing the shakiness in his mom's voice, Izuku stopped struggling. He looked at his mom who clearly relaxed. Looking away, Izuku slowly nodded, to Inko's pleasure. Seeing this, Inko slowly led Izuku down the couch as she sighed in relief. She then went to the kitchen to get some drinks, leaving Izuku on his own. Izuku was shifting anxiously on his side of the couch while waiting for his mom to come back. Not really mentally prepared to have a conversation with his mom. In his anxiety, he began to look around in the living room. It had been that long since he had stayed in this room. Izuku was too busy in his conduit training to relax on the couch. If not in training, he was in his room doing his homework, writing quirk entries and just sleep in general. He was snapped out of his train of thought when a cup was placed in front of him. In front of him was a cup of green tea. Izuka looked at the direction of his mom, who was sitting next to him slowly sipping her tea. Izuka took his cup and slowly sipped it trying not to burn himself. They stayed like that for a minute or so and was feeling awkward. As Izuka was about to stand up to go to his room as another ditch effort in avoiding the conversation, his mom began to talk. I'm sorry, she said quietly, Izuka barely heard her. Izuka was about to ask her why when she cut her off. No, Izuka, listen. Don't talk, please, she pleaded, looking at her son. Izuka shut his mouth and quieting down. Inko took this as an indication to continue. I'm sorry for everything. I'm sorry for not supporting you on your dream. I was had a choice to either support you after the time you got diagnosed as quirkless. But I chose to apologize to you. A tear fell down on Inko's cheek as she recalled the memory. She remembered how Izuka was depressed as he asked her if he can be a hero like All Might. I was so sad that I failed to give you a quirk. 
I feel like it was my fault that you can't become a hero. I'm sorry for that, Izuku. Izuku was about to interrupt her when she raised a hand, stopping him in his tracks. Reluctantly, he stopped. Sniffing, she continued. I'm sorry for avoiding you after our last conversation. I have no reason to do that but I feel like you might need some time to cool off. So I did just that, she said while wiping off another tear. Inko held her cup in a grip as she continued talking. But the time that you hugged me from behind and apologized to me, I couldn't find the right words to say and when you said that you were hiding the pain so that I won't worry had hurt me. She looked back at Izuku only to see he was looking down his cup. His dark green hair covering his eyes but the wet streaks coming down his freckled cheeks said it all. He was crying. Taking a deep breath, Inko readied herself on the next thing she was going to say. Here goes nothing. With another deep breath she said it. And I'm sorry that you had to hide to me that you are a conduit. As she said it, she saw Izuka flinch violently. Her son slowly looked up to her with wide eyes and a shock expression. She also noticed that he was shaking. Seeing his reaction made her cry. Yes. I know. I just found out actually. She chuckled slightly. What are the chances that you met the banner man in person? Her chuckling ended as she turned towards Izuku and gave him a small smile. Even though you hid the fact that you are a conduit from me, I can't blame you. I know how conduits are treated in the society and I know that you are afraid to be isolated from your peers and by extension from me. Inko wiped a tear off her cheeks before finishing her cup of tea and standing up. I saw it in your eyes that day. Fear of being pushed away and isolated. I understand you. Though some things had been in shambles between us, just know that quirkless or not, conduit or not, you will always be my little Izuku. The person who saved me from my end. Thank you. She said as she walked in front of Izuku and placed a small kiss on top of his head. Lifting her head from his head, she smiled sadly. I love you. With that she left for the kitchen. Well, that is when she heard Izuku stand up. She looked back at her son who had just stood up, face shadowed by his hair. Inko stared at Izuku as his face began to show a look of hesitation as he slowly turned away. Knowing his son was going to his room, she frowned. Izuku was contemplating what to do, he had been confused after his mom had finished talking. On one hand, he could just accept his mom's apology and mend the relationship they have and on the other hand, ignore his mom's apology like how she had done to him. It should be an easy choice but his stressed mind is making it hard for him to decide. Thinking he could use some fresh air, Izuku stood up and slowly turned away. However as he turned away, he saw in front of him was the picture he had on his desk. It was now placed on top of the table holding the television. His confusion being crushed by emotion, Izuku turned back to his mom and used smoke dash to tackle her into a hug. Yelping in surprise, Inko caught Izuku on her arms. He was hugging her tightly as he sobbed his eyes out. Muttering apologies and more apologies, Inko couldn't handle it any longer and hugged him back. They stayed like that, hugging each other. Loving how the feeling of their bodies being close to each other. For the first time since five months ago, they felt safe on each other's arms. Silently vowing to protect each other in any way possible. As they hugged it out, Inko began thinking of Izuku's father and how happy he would be to see them both making up for their mistakes. She smiled as she thought of Izuku's late father, Cole McGrath. Thank you so much for joining me on this incredible journey today. I hope you enjoyed exploring the fascinating what-if scenario of Deku. The possibilities were truly mind-blowing. If you found this video entertaining and thought-provoking, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. Your support means the world to me and inspires me to bring you more captivating content in the future. Stay tuned for more exciting what-if stories and other amazing videos coming your way. Until next time, take care, stay curious, and keep embracing the power of imagination.